Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. We just wrapped up our, our interview with Rabbi Daniel Lappin, and we're big fans of Rabbi Lappin. We've got two of his books that he's read here, and he is uh, his nickname, I believe, is America's Rabbi. Ooh, I don't know if you knew that. That's a cool uh, nickname. Exactly, but uh, he is a best-selling author and a TV host, and he's got a great website. He's got a whole bunch of information on there, but uh, today we asked him, uh, some really uh, good questions as far as in regards to finance, Anthony. What's some? What were some of your takeaways? Well, I, t- I was looking forward to this as soon as he was uh, agreed to be on our podcast. I was pumped. Went back and went through his books. When uh, thou shalt prosper, and then the the business secrets of the Bible. And I, I've had the honor to see him speak a few years ago. And just a wealth full of knowledge, but. I, I will say, though, I, I was very disappointed. Why is that? Well, because we've had many guests on. I've never had to apologize <laughs> to a guest because of my co-host questioning and, and comment. So to Rabbi Lappin, again, I apologize. I mean, I'm saying that in jest. We actually had a very good time. It, it was very good, and I, I learned a lot. Every time I hear him speak, I always pick up a couple different things. And one in particular was he talked about is money physical or spiritual. Mm-hmm. That was a good one. Yeah. And I've never really sat back and, and, and took a look at it. But uh, he's going to go through on, you know, what the difference between being physical and spiritual is. And to me, I think it's important to know the difference. Because what – and we talk about this because I actually had a story I was going to share during the intro. But you went ahead and – threw it in the main thing. So I went ahead and ha- shared that story there. You're welcome. But w- what I found is a, a lot of times the biggest obstacle in people's success is, is junk that's going on in their mind. Whether it's a disbelief about maybe their ability or, or business or, or maybe a lot of it is, is their view on money. Like they don't feel comfortable or is it kind of money good or money bad. And what he talks about money is he called it um, dollars are like certificates of good work. Is that what, is that of how ser- we said? Of service, yeah. Certificates of service. <clears throat> and really, you make money by providing value to others. And I think by looking at it that way can help people really not, not be guilty mm-hmm. about making money. And really, if it's all about providing value to others, then the, the dollars that you have in your bank account is a reflection of that. So I, I, I really enjoyed it. Were any takeaways you had, Cam? Uh, yeah, same here. As I, I loved the conversation that we just had with him, and I actually really enjoyed doing the prep for this podcast because he does have so much stuff that's out there, um, very well-versed. It was, it was excellent. But he had a bunch of really good quotes uh, during a conversation. One of my favorite one was, what's more important, what you know or what you believe? And he said that there's no passion in regards to facts. Beliefs impact relationships. And then he kind of started talking about money. And he said, wrong beliefs about money can condemn you to a lifetime of poverty. Ooh, that, yeah, was, that was good stuff. That was good. That was good. So he expanded it from there. I won't ruin it for you guys, uh, but I know you'll enjoy this episode. All right, Rabbi Lappin, thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to dive right in. And uh, what would you say is the biggest misconception that people have about money? You know, I've got a general rule that uh, every time people say, let me tell you the one most important thing about building a marriage, or let me tell you the most important thing you've got to know about building a business. Or my general rule is that whenever people tell you there's one most important thing, the most important thing to know is that there isn't. Well said. There is nothing that is ever the one most important thing. Uh, At different stages of building a family, uh, you may well be focusing on different things. At different crises or or different circumstances, you will require different tools from your toolbox. And and when it comes to to money, it's it's kind of the same thing. There are so many bad mistakes, but I'm going to do my best to answer your questions, no matter how challenging they may be. I kind of thought you'd start off gentle and and low and that we'd sort of work up to the big ones. If that was a misconception, I'm sorry, that was what I thought. 
but um, but hey, you're, you're, you're Rabbi. I'm going to po- apologize now <laughs> for my partner. You know, a- literally asking the wrong question straight from the beginning. Not Fine. how I would have liked. No, I I accept the apology, and I'll also accept it in the inverse from your partner for you. So you're both covered. <laughs> Touche, touche. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I'll tell you what I think is uh, is perhaps one of the biggest, and that is that money is material instead of spiritual. Mm. Now this just opens up an entire can of worms. So let me let me explain precisely yeah. what I mean. Um, let us say that um, this was not. Uh, a time when we would be conducting our interview um, digitally at a distance. But let's say you invited me to come to your offices in Las Vegas, and uh, you are in Las Vegas, right? We are. We are, and you are invited anytime. Well, I, I would love Cameron that. Didn't and, make and, that clear. I'm and and the, the truth is, I'd, I'd so much rather have, have done this together face-to-face with you in, in a studio or, in a, or anywhere in your office would have been fun. But here we are, but um, but um, uh, the reason I say that is because th- there are certain things that we uh, we immediately have to kind of I've, I've just used words that haven't been defined. I said the biggest uh, misconception is people think money is uh, physical instead of spiritual. But all right, so there we are. I'm in your office. We're all together, and and uh, we might even have an audience while we're recording this interview. Mm-hmm. And uh, and let us say that your plan is to hand out a slice of German black forest cake uh, to each participant, everyone who came to today's seminar. And because I'm a rabbi who uh, has already probably had one slice of German black forest cake too many, I am in no way inhibited. So I go and I swoop down to the first row of the audience and I gather up uh, nine plates of cake that had been distributed to them, bring them back to the uh, platform, and along with the one you gave me, I now have 10. And I'm, I'm really pleased with myself. I've got 10 pieces of cake. And anybody who looks at the scenario realizes that the only reason I have 10 is because I've taken nine from a whole bunch of other people who have zero. Now, a lot of people think that's how money works. If I look at somebody who has a bunch of money, then obviously, some way, if I look hard enough, I'm going to find a whole f- bunch of folks out there who have nothing or less because I have more. So the other analogy would be that um, I have a bunch of candles in my hand, nine, ten candles. I walk into a restaurant where they have one of those teensy weensy little candles on every table. You can barely see where you walk in. You're not going to see your food. So I walk around, and uh, at each table, I take one of my nice big candles, I light it from the little candle on your table, and I stick the candle down on the table. I walk around the whole restaurant, and pretty soon it's like I've got a flaming beacon of incandescence here. I've lit all these candles. What have I taken from anyone else at any of the other tables? And the answer is nothing. I've taken nothing at all. All I've done is add to the general luminescence of the place. I've made the place lighter than it was before. But um, the question we really have to ask ourselves, is money more like candles or more like cake? And the misconception is that uh, money is material. Now, again, if you don't mind, 30 seconds of definition. Material... Material means anything that you can weigh or measure in a laboratory. And so uh, my material qualities are easy to measure in a lab. Uh, You can find out my weight, although I can tell you in advance the scale would be lying. (laughs) And um, you you could measure my skin color. You could measure my eye color. Uh, You could mention how much hair I have. Uh, all of these things you can measure. The truth mm-hmm. is that if you were considering having me join your business as a partner, not a single one of those things would have made any difference to you. 
but I have other qualities. And these are qualities that cannot be measured in a lab. There are no tests for these qualities. These qualities are things like integrity, resilience, uh, the ability to be knocked down onto the floor eight times and still get up and pick up the phone and have a crack at it the ninth time, um, optimism, the ability to articulate ideas fluently to customers or clients. These are useful things. There are no tests anywhere in the world, not in any lab in the world. There's not a single test that can measure any of those qualities. If there were, nobody would ever make any mistakes hiring. Do we all make mistakes hiring? That's why we learn to hire slow, fire, fast. Because we, these are the things we care about. These are the spiritual characteristics. So take note that when I say spiritual, I don't mean godly, virtuous, pious, uh, religious, uh, not at all. I'm talking about characteristics, that are not physical, they're spiritual. They have no way of being measured in a lab. We have no instruments to measure them. And yet, they are the most important things. And so the, the question is, is money physical or spiritual? Is it discs of metal that clink in your pocket? Is it strips of colored paper in your wallet? Uh, how about if I write you a check for $10? Or maybe it's the orientation of iron oxide molecules on, 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 the, on the back of your credit card. Or uh, uh, maybe it's ones and zeros on your bank's hard drive. What, what is money? How about if I shake hands with you and I say, I'll give you $10 on Friday. Is that money? And the answer is, yeah, it's, it's, it's all of the above. But clearly not necessarily physical. I can merely say, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll send you $10 on Friday. Great, money. But nothing physical is exchanged past our hands at all. And so it's hugely important to understand the difference because the general rule from the wonderful world of physics is that um, if you have any physical object, the rule is it can only occupy one point on the space-time continuum. What that means is that uh, if I take this pen, this pen can only be right here at this moment. If I look away for a moment and I come back and it's gone, and now I see this pen on your table in front of you, then you took it from me and it went to you. That's how physical things work. Spiritual things are different. Light is a better example of something spiritual. I can take a light from your candle. I haven't diminished your candle at all. I can let you take a tune. I'll teach you a tune. You go away whistling my tune. You've taken nothing away from me. You've just made the world a, a more musical place. So spiritual things do not suffer from this restriction of being able to only be in one place at a time. Now, if you, will you give me another two minutes on this yeah, topic? Yeah, go Please, for it. yeah. Okay, so definition of money. You know, if you take economics at, at one of the state kindergartens, um, and uh, they'll... Um, Let's say it's a means of exchange. They'll tell exactly Econo economics one hour. Oh, money is a means of exchange, and they've got twenty different ways of saying that, and uh, it's it's all childish and nonsense and unadulterated bilge water. Uh, what money is 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 something at the same time more wonderfully complex and at the same time far more simple. Let me give you a quick example, if I may. Um, yes. I'm about to take my kids off to the uh, to the shopping mall for an afternoon of skating on the ice rink there. And uh, I just get a phone call, and the fellow says, uh, hey, uh, Rabbi Lappin, your main job is being a roofer, right? And I say, yep, I'm a proud roofer. And he says, listen, it's just started raining, have you seen? I don't know why, 
The water's coming through um, our kitchen roof. It's puddling on the floor. My wife is miserable. Click, can you come over right away and fix my roof? I just start saying to him, well, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm on my way out the door. I'm on my way to take the kids to the shopping mall. And suddenly, I, man, what's the matter with you, Lappin? Are you out of your mind? And so I quickly say to him, of course, I'll be over in 10 minutes. I go to the children. I say, you know what? We were going to go to the mall and, and ice skate. We're going to do something much more valuable. We're actually going to make the life of one of God's other children better than it is right now. Now, uh, if, um, if, if you're uncomfortable with me mentioning God's other children, no, no, it's no. cool as well. I, I have no problem with that. So with other human beings, I don't care. It's just the way I, I speak and think. But the point stays exactly the same. The children say, well, if we went ice skating in the shopping mall, all we're doing is pleasing ourselves. We're just being selfish. But if we go and fix a problem that another human being has, we're doing something much more important. They pile in my truck. We load some spare roof shakes. We put in a bunch of my toolbox. We put a ladder in. We race over to the guy's house, slap the ladder up against the side of the house, get up onto the top, get the tools up there, get the roof shakes up there. In half an hour, it's all done. And um, the children take the ladder, put it back in the truck. They take the toolbox back. And uh, the guy comes out to me, says, man, this is, I, I can't tell you how happy I am. If my wife was so miserable with water coming in the, the kitchen, it's fixed, no problem, it's stopped, we've mopped it up, everything is great. I said, terrific, that's wonderful, I'm very happy. We, we truly are happy to have had the chance to serve you. And he says, anything I can do for you? And I say, yes, yeah, a matter of fact, I would like some certificates of good performance. He says, sure, how many would you want? I said, um, I think uh, we need a hundred. He says, no problem. He peels off a hundred green pieces of paper and he gives them to me. And I put the hundred dollars in my pocket and I say to the children, see, these prove that we took care of another human being. So that night, my wife and I decide we've uh, earned ourselves a dinner. And we head over to a restaurant, we walk in, and we find a seat, we sit down. Pretty soon a guy in, a, in a, an overalls comes out and says, uh, what do you want? I said, uh, we want one huge steak, one medium steak, one huge pile of French fries, and one salad. And I'll let you guess which is for who. <laughs> so he says, um, he says, I don't understand. You want me to go and slave over a hot stove just because you feel like steaks and fries? And I say to him, you know, the sign says restaurant up there. That's what I thought. He says, yeah, but this is only for members of the Do Good for Other People Club. I said, well, that's me. He says, what do you mean? I said, I spent the afternoon doing good for somebody else. He says, can you prove it? And I reach into my pocket and I... I take up my, uh, my, my pile and I say, yeah, of course I can, I can prove it easily. This is it. These are my certificates. He says, Hey, you have to say no more, make yourselves comfortable. I'll bring you something to drink. And, uh, in a, f in a few minutes, you're going to have your steaks and fries. And uh, what was that again? A salad. Uh, yeah. I said, don't worry about it. Eat salad. It's fine. Um, and so no problem. At the end of the meal, he says, how is it? I said, fantastic. This was exactly what we wanted. He said, great. Um, he said, now tomorrow, I've got to take my kids to the dentist. And the dentist is also part of the same club where he only takes care of people who are part of the club of taking care of other people. So I would like some certificates of performance from you that I can prove that I too am in there. I said, fine. How many do you want? He says, 60. I peel off 60 from my pile, I hand them to him, and I go on my way. That's what money really is. Wow. And because, because it's spiritual, it mm -hmm. indeed can be in more than one place at a time. And that is why it is that if, um, you know, this is all your fault. I mean, you could have asked me something nice, like, um, you know, how did I come to write a book or, uh, 
Or how did I become a rabbi? Or what's a rabbi got to do with money other than the fact that Jews are disproportionately successful with money? I mean, you could have said a whole lot of things, uh, controversial things, but no, you got to ask the hardest question in the book coming out of the shoot. Fine, not my fault. So, yeah, it's the, not my fault either, Rabbi. It's, we we all it's know my fault, fault for it really is. Cameron. Yeah, we we know about that. You know, I got a question: Why you read, or what drove you to write to write this book? <laughs> okay, but you know, I'm holding up the, the the first one: "Thou thou shall prosper." And one thing I found very interesting is you 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 and you just alluded to it is that the Jewish culture does have a different mindset on how they view money. And a lot of that book describes that. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners and Cameron? Sure. Um, Okay. Another example. I've got to give you an example because it works best. Let's say I decide I got to have a new pair of sneakers. And I want a pair of sneakers with those red lights that in the heel that flash when you walk. Yeah. It's as cool as anything. You're talking camera's language. <laughs> okay. So I, um, I go into a store and uh, some interesting things happen. First of all, the guy, the proprietor of the store, greets me like, like a long lost, long lost friend. He says, welcome, you know, come on in. How can I help you? <laughs> this is cool. And I say, well, I'm looking for a pair of shoes with lights in the heel that flash when you, oh, he says, no problem. Sit down there and let me measure your feet. He goes down on his knees in front of me, takes off my old dress shoes that are uncomfortable, and uh, he measures my feet. Now, I'm thinking to myself, I said, that's really neat. Don't you feel menial kneeling in front of me like that? He says, not at all. I consider it to be a privilege to serve one of God's other children. That's just another way of serving God himself. And I said, well, that's really neat. He says, yeah. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the word customer service and worship service use the same verb. Yeah, that's right. Well, that makes sense. And I'm liking this experience more and more. Pretty soon he brings out a, a pair of shoes, puts them on. And uh, I, this is exactly what I wanted. He said, how much is it? What are, how many certificates of forms? Are he asked me for 20. I give him $20. He says, do you want to wear them or shall I wrap them? I said, no, toss out the old leather dress shoes. I'm getting home in these sneakers. I walk out the door and um, I'm, I'm halfway down the block when the local resident socialist taps me on the shoulder. And he says, I've just noticed that that evil capitalist storekeeper has cheated you out of $20. I watched the thing happen. If you like me, I'm on the side of goodness and virtue. I'll go with you back to the store that you can get back your money. And I say to him, you poor deleted, deluded cretin. You, you don't even understand how happy I am. He says, I know, I don't get that. You, you left $20 in that store. I said, yeah. But look on my feet. I've got these shoes I wanted. Obviously, I wanted them more than I wanted my $20. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done what I did. He says, how much are those worth to you? So I said, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. He said, well, let's do a quick thought experiment. How about if I offer you $30 for them? I said, I don't think so. Um, You know, I've been looking for them for weeks. I've got them. They're just what I want, right size. No, I wouldn't sell them for $30. He says, $40. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, my mother didn't raise any stupid Jews. So <laughs> why, why would I pass up 100% profit in 10 minutes? But I don't know if we've reached the limit yet. So I say to him, you know what? I'm not going to sell them to you for 40, but I'll sell them to you for 50. At that point, we have just established a very important fact. And that is that by doing this transaction, my financial statement, my net worth has gone up by $30. Does that make sense to you both? Yeah. Well, you, we can't walk it through for Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this may take a little longer than I'd planned. So. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi, for serving others and having patience for Cameron. I appreciate it. So what happens is 
Now, again, according to uh, GAAP generally accepted accounting pr uh, procedures, obviously my financial statement looks different, but, but that's all just something that was generated by SEC regulations and by politicians. But a mm -hmm. genuine accounting shows that these shoes have a value of $50 to me. Clearly, I've just proven that. And so, therefore, in the last 10 minutes, by having gone into the store and done this transaction, I converted $20 to $50. Obviously, I'm happy because I can do that all day. This is good for me. So the socialist finally figures that I'm not about to do business with him. He doesn't want to really offer $50, and he, uh, he just wants to fix the world. And he realizes that I don't feel that I was cheated by the evil capitalist. And so he figures I must have had things back to front. This guy is the evil capitalist. The store is the hardworking member of the proletariat. I better go and help him. So he runs to the store and he catches the storekeeper and says, hey, listen, Lap and this guy walked out with a valuable pair of sneakers. If you come with me, I'll help you. We'll get them back from him. And the storekeeper says, you poor deluded cretin. The, um, the wholesale price of those shoes is $10. So I had a $10 asset in my store 10 minutes ago, and now I've got $20 in my till. I switch $10 for $20. That's what I do. I'm happier than I was before. And the socialist goes and hangs himself because he doesn't get it. <laughs> But the reality is that through the magic of human beings serving one another, we have increased the amount of money in this community by $40. I'm $30 better off, and the uh, storekeeper is $10 better off. And so not surprisingly, when transactions stop, we have a recession. Mm. So simple as that. And so this is the magic of money. It comes into being not because I took some from you and not because the storekeeper took some from me. Money comes into being when two or more human beings serve one another. And at the end of that, money has been created apparently out of nothing. And that is the most complex area of money, most widely misunderstood and something that we Jews just happen to be particularly good at getting. And so when we go to work on Monday morning, we don't say, oh, God, another day of having to take instructions from the man. We say, wow, another opportunity to do good for other human beings. Uh, there's a huge difference in how we throw ourselves into that task from the way people who think that uh, money is taking from other people. Interesting. Great story. Now, so what you're, what you're saying is money represents a value that you're providing to others. Money is evidence that I provided value to others. So then having more, because I tell uh, there's a lot of people in town, I've struggled with it too sometimes, where like the, the, if you have money, like that's bad, or businesses are bad, sure. or being wealthy. Because they believe that money is material, and if money is material, then it's like cake, not candles, and therefore if I have some, I'm taking it from other people. They don't believe in making money because they don't believe. You see, material things can't be like that. If I show you a saxophone, you're perfectly entitled to ask me, where did you get the brass from which you made that instrument? I show you a violin, where, where did the wood come from that you made it? But if I teach you a tune, you don't have to say to me, well, where did you take that from? I took it from nowhere. It's spiritual, I conveyed it to you. And so I don't take money, I make money. And it's a hugely different thing. And, uh, and, and that is exactly why so many people are hostile to business, because they understand why a quarterback makes the big bucks. 
because they know that if you threw a ball to them in the middle of a game, they would not be able to do what he does. They, they, they understand why a, uh, a, a baseball player, somebody in the NBA makes a lot, they get that because they can't do it. But what they don't get is why when Warren Buffett becomes the CEO of a company that the value of that company skyrockets and uh, Warren Buffett can walk away with a few million dollars of salary at the end of the first six months. That, that they don't get because they think to themselves, I could do that as well. But they couldn't because they don't even understand the beginnings of what a top-rate business leader brings to his office. Awesome. What, what came to mind, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of what I'm hearing on the material side is that money is a zero-sum game. Right? It's if you yeah, have well, it, I, the only way for me to get it is to take it from you. I, you see, I don't even know what those words mean. I'm a simple guy. Zero sum game. Don't get it. I don't know what it means. <laughs> so the, I, all, all I know is, all I know is that if, if the government stays out of it and doesn't force me to do things and you and I make a deal, the only reason we do that is because at the end of that deal, you've had got more money and I've got more money. Yeah. And the, uh, and the socialist guy thinks to himself, well, there's something wrong here. We must be taking it from someone. And that's because to the socialist, the only things in the world that exist are material. They don't acknowledge, that's why socialism always goes together with atheism, because they don't acknowledge the existence of something spiritual. Money happens to be spiritual. <laughs> okay. What do you mean, okay? I mean, I may not be your uh, partner. Well, I was, what do you mean, Ken? I, I was in, uh, okay, well, I've, I've okay, never sounds, heard... okay sounds begrudging. Okay sounds like you're saying to me, well, I can't argue against you, but I just haven't thought of the right argument. I really don't think you're right. <laughs> that is certainly not what I meant. <laughs> that was okay meant I'm in full agreement with what you had stated, but I'd never heard it stated in that way, right? And so that was a... Yes, okay. of course they think it's a zero-sum game. That's, that's obviously the, the, the problem. Uh, they, they assume that uh, money is taken, not making. Yeah. Yeah, and it was the other thought that I had that kind of went along with that is different mentalities is the way that we, the way that I've conveyed it to clients over the years is a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset, right? And that abundance mindset is, hey, we can all provide value to each other and grow. Whereas a scarcity mindset is, hey, if that's mine, I, I'm going to take it because I need, I need it. And, you know, it's, it's I'm winning, you're losing kind of, kind of deal. And by the way, I mean, you, you, in, in your business, Am, am I correct that you do infinite banking with your customers? Correct. We do. You and your clients, you basically introduce them to how to use mm -hmm. insurance in that fashion. Am I right? Correct. correct. Well, for many people, it's going to seem just as magical as what I described for my socialists, because you really are making them better off. And you're obviously not doing that at a loss to yourself. So it's not you adding money to them, but you're showing them how to create it. And for people who don't understand, it seems like magic what you do. Yeah, we get it a lot. Is uh, well, The other thing that came to mind is Anthony and I were talking about this. We had this conversation earlier today, and you were talking about kind of your mental headspace over the last several years in which you've kind of grown and changed to more of an abundance mindset, right? You remember? Yeah, I was going to share that in our intro story, but uh, <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was fitting for this. But you, you can but say it. you know, one thing I'd realized that um, that I think some people have, and I got this also from the book, the Mil Millionaire Mindset. I think what was the name of the book, but he talked about the way people view money, and that. Oftentimes people have this figure in their head, like mentally they're comfortable making a certain amount of money. And then if they make more than that, they get a little bit uncomfortable, right? And, um, and I know for me, going back to my, way back to my days in college, I mean, I was always kind of a poor student. Then I had the GI Bill, but then I suddenly got a, a, like a more of a real job. And I had... I had extra money for the first time in, in my life 
I, I wish I could say, well, man, well, I started saving that. But you know what I did? I, I was uncomfortable. I ended up making decisions to get me back to my comfort zone. I ended up buying a car. So now I had a car payment. So now my, now I was somewhere where I was comfortable with. And so we, we, a lot of what we teach our clients, right? We, we want them to be financial independent, not just dollars, but, but, but also cents. And I, so I like, um, as in common sense and knowledge, I mean, your mindset is so important. And I think a lot of the people have these misconceptions of, of, of money and these negative mindsets. Rabbi, what are some things our listeners could do to help them have that more abundant mindset? I mean, for one, I tell them to check out a couple of your books, that Thou Shalt Prosper and the Business Secrets from the Bible. But what's more advice would you give them? Uh, well, those, those are very good first steps because, as I said when we started, uh, nobody should think that I can toss out three little tricks. You know, do these three little tricks and you're on your – it's not like that because it's not just about things you do. Um, it's the way you think it's the kind of person you are. And these take, uh, you know, these take weeks and months to, to change. Um, in the same way that, you know, to, you went and took out a loan to buy a car. Today, you would never let a client of yours go to GM Finance and pay, you know, 6 or 7 or 8% for a car loan. You wouldn't do that, right? Right. You wouldn't let a client do that. You'd show them how to buy a car in a completely different way. And in, in, in the same way, uh, I would say to, to people, look, um, what is more important for you as a human being, your identity, who you are, what's more important, what you know or what you believe? Now, the difference is I know that Mount Rainier, 70 miles south of Seattle, is 14,400 feet high. And the three of us are not going to have a really interesting conversation at this point if we start discussing, well, is it 14,403 or is it uh, 4, 14,398 feet? Uh, come on, guys, you know, check in with Dr. Google, get the answer. We, there's no discussion of any interest at all about facts. There's no passion about facts. But if I now say that nowhere in the world is there a more beautiful mountain visible from the city hall of any major city than Mount Rainier, well, now there's a belief. And you might say, you might say, excuse me, have you ever seen Mount Fuji in Japan? And we can talk about what makes a, a mountain beautiful. Is it symmetry? Uh, is it the snow on it? Yeah. And we have a bit of a conversation about aesthetics. But beliefs trump facts. You know, if, uh, uh, if I have a friend who, who, God forbid, has an arm amputated because of a medical problem, he's still my friend. It's no difference. Um, if, uh, if, uh, you know, if a married couple, one, one of a spouse loses a leg, they, they're still married. It's the same thing. And what happens if one of the, if my friend um, who I always used to go and talk to about baseball scores. He knew all the facts about baseball. One day he had a stroke and he comes out of his, everything, thank God, is good, but he, he has no knowledge of baseball facts anymore. Do I say to him, well, I guess we can't be friends anymore? Of course not, because the facts aren't important. But what happens if my best friend comes to me one day and says, uh, you know, um, I used to believe in the free market. And I say, yeah, we've had many, many conversations. He said, it's all wrong. It's evil. I believe Stalin was a savior of the Russian people, and I've become a socialist. Do I say to him, well, it doesn't matter. Come, let's go have a beer. I don't. I'm profoundly bothered. His beliefs have changed. This impacts our relationship. What happens if uh, a husband tells a wife, um, you know, I've, uh, I've come to believe that an open marriage is what I really believe in. 
come to believe that I should be free uh, to have relationships with many different women. And by the way, if you want to do the same, you go, go ahead. What does a normal uh, wife says to him? I hope you're joking, because if you're not, I don't think I can stay married to you. When beliefs change, it's hugely fundamental. And, and I want this to be really, really clear, because wrong beliefs about money can condemn you to a lifetime of financial problems. That's how important it is. And so um, there are many wrong beliefs about money. Uh, we, we spoke about a very important one earlier on. If you believe that money is material, and you may not necessarily have thought about the nomenclature, physical, spiritual, material, you may not have thought of that, but you might just have thought in terms that, uh, you know what, uh, people who have a lot of money, they must have done something wrong to get it. Deep down, you have, now it wouldn't be shocking for you to have that because you're indoctrinated that way by popular entertainment. Um, who's the evil guy in primetime television? Uh, who's the villain in movies? Who commits most murders? Young single males? No, rich business professionals. That's who commits murders. And we've all seen the scenario a thousand times. You know, I, I can name 20 different movies, but they're all the same. The camera pans up the gleaming skyscraper, zooms in on the uh, penthouse window, and there behind the desk sits this white, usually white, uh, corrupt businessman of this big company whose name is outside on the top of the skyscraper. And he's being confronted by the brave, good-looking young environmentalist who's accusing him of ruining the environment. And finally, the businessman reaches into the top drawer of his desk and pulls out what I'm sure you keep in the top drawer of your desks, and I sure do. Every respectable businessman pulls out of his the drawer of his desk a uh, Smith and Weston 357 Magnum six inch revolver. I mean, what businessman doesn't keep that in his desk? Right, yeah. And then he shoots. He's about to shoot the young hero, but the uh, United States cavalry cavalry burst through the door, and the credits begin to roll as they caught the evil businessman off to jail. That's the format. We all know it. Businessmen are evil, and it indoctrinates people. By the way, even popular culture does this. What's the language used when a wealthy philanthropist makes a gift to a hospital? Everyone says, An endowment. oh, giving how back. wonderful. It's, he's giving back yeah. to society. They all say that. And you'll even hear some stupid businessmen themselves saying, well, I felt it was time for me to give back. You moron, do you not understand what you've just said? You have just acknowledged that if you are giving back by making a gift, then when you were making the money in the first place, you were ripping off. That's what you've just said. Or how about if I make a few dollars and I put my money at risk by investing in an enterprise, that gives jobs to new people, to people, and makes products that people want. And then at the end of the day, I actually end up with a small profit, which doesn't always happen with venture capital. And I actually make a profit. At the end of it, you know what the government calls that money I just made? Unearned income. Really? It's pretty bad. So it's not surprising that people end up with the notion that uh, making money is somehow evil. And they end up with a dreadful equation. Poverty equals virtue. Poverty mm -hmm. equals piety. Poverty equals holiness. Poverty equals you're a good person. If you're poor, it shows you didn't stab any widows and orphans on your relentless climb to success. That's what people believe. Does that make sense? It, it does. Thank you. And uh, You're not going to insult our guests, right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I'm going to go anyways. <laughs> Is, uh, you mentioned something about wrong beliefs. Uh, wrong beliefs are about... Uh, wrong beliefs can condemn you to a lifetime of failure, something like that. Uh, that poverty. Made me think lifetime of poverty. Lifetime of poverty. Is, uh, for some reason, that made me think of the idea of retirement. What are your thoughts on, on retirement? Well. Um, 
it's um, it's actually the last chapter of um, one of the books. Business, uh, thou shalt prosper. The Ten Commandments for making money. Mm -hmm. The Tenth Commandment is never retire. Here's what's wrong with retiring. Uh, first of all, the um, the example I like giving is this. You see, here, here's my challenge. I have to find a way to explain to you how it is that if I have a bad intention to do something two years down the road, that is going to diminish my performance today. Because most people assume, hey, if you're going to be doing it down the road, it doesn't make any So let's imagine my plan is to rip you off in two years' time. The fact that that's my plan makes me less effective today. And the reason is because I'm a spiritual being. I'm not a machine. And that means that I may well have a conscience deep down. It also means that I have a face that uh, reflects my being. And many people are adept at reading faces. Not everybody, but women are generally better than men at reading faces. Not always, but often. And so the very fact that I intend malfeasance down the road could well make me less effective now. Uh, an example from a game I know absolutely nothing about, golf. But one thing I do know is that the swing is important. Mm -hmm. And I do know that golf coaches, a lot of time working on your swing. And, um, and the coach might say to me, look, the club has to end up exactly here behind your head up. That's where it must end up at the end of your swing. I would say to him, hey, you know what? Stay out of my face. Your business is to teach me how to do the swing from the time I start till the time I hit the ball. None of your business what I do with the club after it's hit the ball. Once it's hit the ball, the trajectory of that ball is already set. And if so, I choose afterwards to balance the club on my head and dance an Irish jig, none of your business. And I'm wrong in his right. Because if I do not plan to hit the ball as part of a coherent, harmonious, integrated swing that of necessity has the club ending up over here, I'm not going to hit the ball right. In other words, if you don't plan the whole follow through, you're not going to hit the ball right on the way. Here's the problem with planning to retire. Retiring means that I am working only for the money. And when I've got enough, I'm going home. Now, look at, that, look at how that feels from my point of view. All of these years, you guys have been helping me with my money. I don't, I don't take a step without picking up the phone. You always take my phone call or you call me back. You tell me whether what I'm planning is, is a good idea or not a good You give me a better way to do what I want to do. One day I call you up, and here is what I get. I'm really sorry. Uh, we can't help you anymore because um, uh, here at Infinite Wealth, uh, we've retired. And I say, how dare you? I've been your client all these years. I've counted upon you. Why are you retiring? You're perfectly healthy. Yeah, we want to retire while we can still enjoy golf. Hey, come on. What's more important, your golf or taking care of me? Oh, well, God. Well, I'm, I, how could I not have seen it all these years? I should never have been with you in the first place. You never really cared about me. You really cared about you. When you got enough money, you were out of here. That's the problem with retirement. I like doing business with people who have no interest in retirement because they are infatuated with helping me. I, uh, I was somebody, I wasn't even looking, but somebody said, I want to recommend you a doctor. This was just last night. And I said, what's the best thing about him? They said, well, the guy's 70. He's got a lot of experience and he has no interest in retiring. You know what I said? Give me his name and phone number. I'm interested. <laughs> because that's a guy who goes about this a different way. And so, yes, obviously, if I didn't get certificates of performance, I wouldn't work for you. Obviously, I want certificates of good performance from you. 
But that is a consequence. It's not the cause. The cause is, I love serving you. That's the problem with retirement. Now, you meant like words, words are words are very important and you you have alluded to it a couple times whether money's spiritual or physical we've we've done a whole podcast on the difference between savings investing speculation you know cameron is big on there's a big difference between hair gel and hair mousse <laughs> right and you have a big one in regard with regards to the word retire and one thing i've learned so much from you and, and i think one that I use today is you have how many times the word retire is in the Bible? And the answer is zero. And it, you even mentioned that that wasn't even a word. Would you mind kind of expanding on like the Hebrew word for retirement? And yeah. So uh, the second governor of the Plymouth colony was Sir William Bradford came over on the Mayflower and, uh, he wrote the, in his own handwriting, the first few pages of his history are in Hebrew. And he says, uh, Hebrew is the Lord's language. And what makes it so fascinating as the Lord's language is that the words that do not, concepts for which there are no words in the Lord's language are false concepts. And so obviously in Israel, which is one of the most modern first world countries in the world, Obviously, there are words for jet plane and telephone and television and computer. Um, but in terms of uh, the Bible, right, or even just look at the five books of Moses, 82,000 words uh, covering almost every kind of human experience imaginable. In all of that, there is no Hebrew word for the word fair. Why? <laughs> it's a made-up concept. It has no reality. What does fair mean? Does fair mean equal? Well, then say you mean equal. But what does fair mean? That we play on a on a on a crooked board. Well, that's cheating. But what does fair mean? There is no word. The, the word means absolutely nothing. <coughs> when politicians say the rich aren't paying their fair share, they are exploiting this falsehood inherent in the word fair. Because our next question would be to the politician, well, how much would be fair? And they will never answer that question because they don't want to be tied down to a number. They always want to be able to elevate that number and escalate that number at their preference. And so they like using the word fair. But you should run miles quickly whenever somebody uses the word fair with you. Um, I don't know how in utero children learn to say, it's not fair. I have no <laughs> idea what, a, what evil, malignant angel teaches children in utero the magic words, it's not fair. But as parents, you know, let's not be taken in by that. Uh, a word, adolescent. No word in Hebrew for adolescent. You know what an adolescent is? It's a weird being that wants all the advantages of childhood along with all the advantages of being an adult. There are no adolescents in the Lappin family. You can choose. You can be an adult or you can be a child, whatever you wish. <coughs> and you will be treated accordingly. But adolescent, out of the question. And um, uh, retirement is just another one of those words for which nothing exists. What do you mean? What does retire mean? <laughs> it's just, you think about it in serious terms. Why would you stop work? And by the way, I, you know, it's tragic, but how often do you find people's health going down badly when they quit work? And when you, when you hear stories about somebody who you know, lives and living a great life at 93, one of the almost inevitable accompaniments of that story is, and I haven't stopped working a single day. Yep. So retirement is a really bad idea. Oh, good. Well, by the way, yeah. by the way, just one caveat. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest and make money cleverly so as that you could always stop working if you had to or wanted to. But you shouldn't stop working. Right. Like our, our view, a lot of times if you ask people why they want to retire, it's because they don't enjoy what they do. 
So what we want to help people is, well, then let's fix that. Let's find something that you're passionate about and that, and that well, you There's also to. something wrong in that because it's natural for human beings to become passionately enamored of things they do well. And so uh, almost invariably, whenever you see interviews with mm -hmm. people, you know, who've been uh, in law enforcement all their lives or they've been in insurance all their lives or they've been bookkeepers all their lives or they've been plumbers all their lives. And the interviewer always says, if you had to do it all over again, you could relive life. What would you like to be? Nine times out of 10, the people always say, I'd want to do exactly what I'm doing. I love my work. That's not because by some miracle, some angel linked their special soul that loves plumbing along with a plumbing job. It's that as human beings, we get to love that which we do really well. Well, no, I'm with you because I, I actually remember, I've heard you in interviews when, you know, instead of finding something you're, or take something you love to make money of it, no. find a need, uh, find an opportunity and fill that need. That's right. Right. So what, what, just to explain, I don't want any of our listeners to think Cameron and I are going to retire per se, but what we want what we're building and what we want our clients to build is that as you get older, you get wiser, you have more information. We, we should, we should be sharing it by just kind of hanging up and just watching TV and watching family feud where you were actually doing a disservice to, to, to others. Let's, and so maybe we work less if that's the deal or maybe ideally we're looking, ideally what we want our clients to do is that they have the financial freedom to work because they want to work, not because they have to work. That's right. And what we found is when you find something that you enjoy doing, you're not going to want to stop. Right. It's not, it's not really the old saying is if you love what you do, it's, it's not considered work. Well said, Anthony. Let's uh, let's kind of wrap this up. I know we've got just a few minutes here uh, left with you, but uh, if I could, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you became familiar with the infinite banking concept and uh, follow that up with if somebody was on the fence of practicing that, what would you tell them? Look, I know that uh, many um, advisors, in, including one famous one that I'm very friendly with, uh, speak against it. I understand that. And for certain types of people in certain types of financial situations, um, I think you and I would, would be among those who say, yeah, you're right. It's not for you. But for many other people, um, it's, um, uh, it's a fantastic tool to use in one's uh, financial toolbox. And um, I, I became aware of it, uh, you know, only in the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was enchanted with it. I, I really saw it as an opportunity uh, for people to expand their financial consciousness and through that to enlarge their, their bank account, to enlarge their assets. So I'm, I'm very much enthusiastic about it. Uh, I've encouraged uh, several in my family who have successfully moved into the field and uh, and um, and uh, and started the uh, the process. So yeah, I'm. Um, I, I think at the very least, I would recommend that if if there are people listening right now who have no idea what we're talking about, they need to pick up the phone and and call you guys. And at least I'm sure you'd be happy to give them an education on on what it's all about with no at, you know with no obligation, right? Absolutely. And if, uh, and if somebody wanted more information with uh, some of your teachings, where can they find it? Well, uh, the best place is my website. And the, the website is really easy to remember. You all, the name of the website, the URL is youneedarabbi.com. Simple as that. Love youneedarabbi.com. So what are some of the things that they're going to find there? Free beer for the rest of your life. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I mean, so who wouldn't want that, right? No, I think it sounds great. I'm going there right now. Blue Moon. Yeah. Um, and where would you go? I would go to uh, I need a rabbi.com. 
<laughs> I knew you were going to screw that up. <laughs> you need a rabbi.com. You need a rabbi.com. Exactly. <laughs> Again, rabbi, my apologies uh, uh, for Karen. Uh, now, so you have a couple gr great books. I I've, I've read both of these, Thou Shalt Prosper and the Business Secret, Secrets of the Bible. And yeah. now, did I, did I, now, you also recently started a podcast. Oh, yeah. The podcast has been going for a couple of years. Podcast is, is terrific. It's, uh, it, you know, as you can tell, during this conversation, I, I felt restrained and inhibited. But on the podcast, uh, I speak completely freely. And, um, and so you'll see that on my website as well. We also have a new uh, product, a 10-part video training program called the Financial Prosperity Collection. And uh, people can read about that. Uh, at youneedarabbi.com, head over to the store and take a look at the Financial Prosperity Collection. It's 10 video lessons uh, of the things, the specific things that people have to change in their beliefs, their outlooks, and their behavior in order to, no, not make a lot of money tomorrow, but to make this year a much, much better financial year than it would otherwise have been. And there is still time to do exactly that. Awesome. Thanks so much. We'll make sure that uh, we put those links in the show notes. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate that. Rabbi, we are, we're honored to have you. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a great pleasure, and I very much look forward to meeting you once I resume traveling again, and, uh, and Las Vegas will be on my usual circuit. Well, and actually, you mentioned earlier that you're going to send us $10. <laughs> you know, so I will, I, I'll send you an email with our address. but. Um, but, yeah, please, please do that. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and we did speak about sending money, but my recollection was, was going to be going in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, I think we're going to send you some blue moon. How's that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or else we'll just wait till we get together and we'll split it then. That's that a deal. sounds fantastic. That sounds great. Thank you. Ray. All right. Wonderful. All right. Great seeing you guys. Good luck. And I know you're doing a fantastic service for your clients. Thank, Thank you. you and make it a fantastic day. Take care.